I'm, t- I'm trying to get up the energy. Good morning, everyone. I guess I need to apologize to Derek. I keep moving on him. Derek's good to go. Hope you're well. Hope everyone is doing all right. I know we have some guests with us this morning. We're glad to have you. Certainly glad to have our members here, those joining us online. Um, We are studying the book of Galatians. We'll be in chapter 3. If you want to go ahead and be making your way there, we'll uh, deal with some housekeeping matters while you're doing that. First of all, thanks to Kevin for uh, filling in last week while we were at camp. Um, we, uh, we had a good camp, uh, a healthy camp, and, uh, that was, uh, that was important. One of our, uh, high levels of importance was to hopefully be able to do that, and, and God blessed us in that way, and we're grateful for that. Um, uh, haven't had a chance to get, uh, any of the numbers from uh, the Blue Haven session <clears throat> from the webs, but we'll get those and pass them along to you. But I can pass along some numbers from our session at Bandina. We had, uh, where am I? I can't, re- oh, here we go. We had 248 uh, campers and um, 10 pre-campers. 59 counselors, 27 staff, so a total of 344 uh, people on site. We had uh, nine baptisms, uh, 11 uh, other uh, requests for prayer uh, from, from campers, and so, um, so that was good. Uh, really good. So we're grateful to have had the opportunity to go back and do that this year. And um, <clears throat> the um, campers seem to have a great time. Lots of smiles and laughs and hugs. The staff as well. It was just all in all a really good, really good camp. And so we were grateful to be able to be a part of that this year. And I'm certain that uh, Blue Haven had a good a good camp as well. I look forward to getting more of those <clears throat> numbers and stats that we can pass along to you from that session also. I think that's it, housekeeping-wise. Let's go to God in prayer, then we'll study together. Holy Father, we thank you for the blessing of this morning. Thankful that uh, in your providence and in your grace, uh, we are able to assemble together for this period of Bible study. We pray that our worship assembly uh, a little later this morning will uh, bring honor and glory to your name and that we would derive benefit from that and strength from that. We thank you for uh, opportunities to be involved in kingdom work and we pray that you would uh, allow us to have more opportunities to do that, that you would strengthen us in those good works. We pray for our church family here. We pray for especially those of our number who <clears throat> are who are sick at present. Uh, we have some that are recovering from surgeries. We have uh, others that are in uh, rehabilitation facilities, and we pray in hospitals. We pray, Father, that with each one, you would bless them in harmony with their need and certainly in harmony with your will. Use us, Father, in your service to your glory. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, Galatians chapter 3. When last we uh, were studying together in Galatians 3, we covered essentially verses 10 through 12. Um, And we usually cover more than that in in a class session, but We took some time last time to talk about the nature of the law of Moses uh, because that's really one of the underlying 
uh, things that's, that's in back of what Paul is writing about in Galatians. It has to do with the way, the way Jewish people generally, and Jewish Christians specifically, viewed the law of Moses, what their attitude toward it was, and how they, how they approached the law. And, and so the question that we dealt with last time, two weeks ago, was whether or not the law of Moses, as God gave it and as God intended it, was a legalistic uh, law system. Was it, was it designed by God to be a meritorious uh, system of law? Was that the way God intended for people to use the law? Was that its purpose? Or was the law of Moses... In, in this sense, the same as the law of Christ, in this sense, that the laws given were the means by which we could express our faith and our trust in God, that, that God is our Savior, and certainly under the new covenant, following the death and resurrection of Jesus, He is our, our Savior, and the law that God has given us is the means, is, is the, the visible manifestation. Our obedience to the law is our visible manifestation of our faith and our confidence in our Savior to do for us what we can't do for ourselves. We can't be sinless. We can't be flawless. We have weaknesses. And even the best of us on our... With, with the best of intentions and with as much um, with as much desire as we can muster, we still stumble, don't we? We still fail. There are things that we leave undone that we ought to do. There are things that we shouldn't do that we do. The strongest of Christians is imperfect. But if law is all we have, if we don't have a Savior, if we don't have grace, if we don't have mercy, if law is it, and if our standing, our status before God is determined by nothing more than law, we're without hope. If righteousness comes by law, Jesus died for nothing. Galatians 2.21. The problem was... The Jewish people generally, in the time of Christ, had essentially elevated the law to be their Savior. The Pharisees, more specifically. The Pharisees were more confident in their ability to keep the law than they should have been. And they had more confidence in their ability to keep the law than they had in God to save them by his mercy and grace. The parable of the Pharisee and publican in Luke 8 illustrates that. As the Pharisee prayed, thus with himself, Jesus introduced that parable. His prayer had little to do with God. It had a lot to do with himself. Where the Pharisee said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. You know, and he lists a number of sins, Look, all these things I don't do, but here's what I do. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. There was nothing in that prayer that said, God, I'm so thankful that you're gracious. I'm thankful that you're merciful to me. And I need your mercy. That was the, that was the, um, that was the prayer of, of the publican, the tax collector. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. His confidence was in the nature of his God. The Pharisee's confidence was in himself. All right? That's the difference. And it was out of that Pharisaical tradition that these Judaizers in Galatia had come. Acts 15, those from the sect of the Pharisees who were believers, all right? So these were Christians that had come out of the Pharisaical tradition. They were the ones that were saying, if Gentile men are not circumcised, 
they can't be saved. If, and if Gentiles generally don't keep certain customs of the law of Moses, they can't be saved. Well, why would they say that? Because they felt like their confidence in salvation was in that law. And so if that was the way they were going to be saved, and that's the way they always thought they were saved, was in their adherence to that law, then if Gentiles were going to be saved, they were going to have to keep that law too. So they were binding on Gentile converts to Christianity certain elements of the law of Moses as a means through which they could save themselves, just like those Pharisaical Christians felt like they had saved themselves. There wasn't, there wasn't an emphasis on their need for a Savior. There was just an emphasis on their need to and ability to to just keep God's law. And that was the problem. Their attitude toward the law was wrong. Instead of approaching the law as a means of expressing their faith in the God who could save them, they approached the law as if the law itself could save them. All right? And so we spent a lot of time in our last class talking about that and looking at passages that showed, and, here, and here's the kicker to me, that, that proves that the law of Moses was never intended by God to be a legalistic system of merit. Because if it were, then no one who lived under that law would ever go to heaven. Except Jesus, who was the one who did keep it perfectly, but we're putting him in a class by himself. No one who lived under that law would be able to be saved under that law if they didn't keep that law perfectly, if it was a meritorious system. Because nobody kept it perfectly but Jesus. But are there going to be, are there, are there Old Testament saints that lived under the law of Moses and therefore will be judged by that law that are in glory? Well, sure. You even have people in the New Testament that are labeled as being blameless who lived under that law. Zacharias and Elizabeth, Luke 1 verse 6. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Well, if that was a meritorious system, then Luke just told us they were perfect. But they weren't perfect. But they were blameless. Well, how could they be blameless under that law? Because they approached the law the proper way. They approached it as a means of expressing their faith and confidence in the God who could save them. Jesus, yes, sir. Let me get over there and look. John 5, 29. <clears throat> Yes, at the resurrection, those, uh, you know, the, the, the dead will come forth. Those who did good to a resurrection of life. Those who did evil to a resurrection of judgment. Is that the one you're thinking of? 39? 39. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these or that testify about me. Yes, I think that's exactly, I think it's a great passage that illustrates that. Um, John 5, 39 and 40. Um, Jesus is telling them, and incidentally, let me, you may read from a translation in John 5, 39 that makes that first statement a command, an imperative. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. It's an unfortunate translation because that's not an imperative statement. It's a declarative statement. He's not telling them in John 5, 39 what they are supposed to do. He's telling them what they do, do. You search the scriptures. All right? Did the Pharisees do that? Sure. Yeah. You search the scriptures. And in them, you think you have eternal life. But they, the scriptures testify of me and you won't come to me that you might have life they weren't looking for a savior they thought they had everything that they ever needed in the law and so they felt like they could be 
They could be found right with God because they could keep the law. Instead of saying, I want to submit myself to God, my Savior, by obeying his law, but I know ultimately if I'm going to be, if my sins are going to be atoned for, it's going to be because of God's mercy and grace. All right? And so there's, there's a, it's just a difference in our mentality in the way we approach the commandments that God has given us. It doesn't mean that we don't have commandments that God wants us to keep. We do. But if, my ability, but, if, but if my salvation is going to be rooted in and based on my ability to keep those commandments perfectly, I'm out of luck. I ought to just give up now. Because I've already broken a whole bunch of them in my life. Haven't you? Well, the only thing law can do is condemn. That's all it can do. Law can't save you unless you're able to keep it perfectly. So if you're not able to keep it perfectly, then your salvation rests ultimately on something else. And praise be to God, it does. It rests on his mercy and grace. All right, so there's a balance that has to be maintained. My salvation is rooted in the grace of God. It's not rooted in my ability to be perfect. Now, we talked about the legalistic mindset a little bit more, and I'll, and I'll mention this again, and then we'll, we'll move on further in Galatians. A legalistic mindset, and by a legalistic mindset, I mean the mindset of the Pharisee that believes that, in essence, you don't need a Savior, you just need a law. That, will, that mindset will result in one of two things, ultimately. It's either going to lead a person to complete and total despair. It, it will lead a person to living a joyless life. And there are Christians who lead joyless lives, who have no confidence in their salvation. I used to be one of those. I may have shared this story with you in the past, but I remember one time at a... Um, I was a youth gathering or something uh, when I was uh, a teenager. And uh, the speaker was, you know, was, was addressing the, the, the concept of salvation and our confidence in, in, in being right with God. And, and he asked the question, if, 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 you, if you died right now, are you confident that you'd go to heaven? Do you know you'd go to heaven? And then he got specific and that's what I get for sitting up on the second row because he looked at me and he said, do you, know, do you know that you're saved? Do you know that you'll go to heaven? I didn't. I wasn't confident. And I just kind of, you know, mumbled an answer that probably came out with, I, I hope. I mean, I hope so. But I didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't know. I didn't have confidence. And it wasn't too long after that that, that my preacher at the time, I, I, guess, I guess he noticed. <laughs> and so he took me aside and we, and we studied together. And he, and he helped me to better understand the confidence that a Christian can have. And I still struggled with it for years. And there, and there are times that there are times that I, I still, you know, try to, to try to move back in that direction of, of a wavering confidence. But it's nothing like it used to be. Because I think, I think by the grace of God, I've come to better understand the grace of God. And better understand the basis, the foundation of salvation. And it's not in my ability to be perfect. Now, back to, back to where I was headed with that. A, a mindset that is focused on law as a means of justification is going to either lead a person to complete and total despair because you know you're not perfect. But if my salvation rests on my ability to be perfect, where's my confidence? Where, where, uh, on, what, on what day could I ever live with confidence in my salvation 
if my confidence is rooted in my own ability. And so there are Christians who live lives without joy, without peace of mind, without confidence, because they know they can't be perfect, but there's something in their minds that's telling them they have to be in order to be saved. And so it's a complete, completely joyless Christianity. Jesus did not die so that you and I could stumble through life without any confidence. All right, so there's, I'll get you in just a second. So there's, there's one t- response to that. The other response to the legalistic mindset is complete and total arrogance. Because there are some people that have that legalistic mindset that have convinced themselves they can do it. They, they do know how to do it. And they are right with God because they're not wrong about anything. They, they, they are able to do everything the right way. And therefore, they ultimately put themselves in a position of doling out judgment on everybody else, from individuals to congregations to everything else, because they, they are doing it right all the time. And so you've got those complete, those total polar opposite extremes, either complete despair or, shall I be blunt, Kevin? Or Christian jerks. Jesus didn't die so that we could be either of those. Yes, Roger, guess. Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. We can, the, the, the legalistic mindset that goes the arrogant route is always, if, 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 not, if not consciously willing to say they're perfect, they're certainly willing to say, I'm better than you are. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Well said, well said. So what Paul is trying to do, let's get back to Galatians now. What Paul is trying to do is counter that mentality by by trying to help those those Judaizing teachers, those legalistic minds in the churches of Galatia to reason properly through their own position so that hopefully they can realize where that mindset is taking them in relation to Jesus. And that that type of mentality is, um, it's not only counter to the gospel, it's it's counter to, um, well, it, it can't be maintained consistently. And any, and any kind of, of, doctrinal position that is inconsistent is itself false. Self-contradictory is the word I'm trying to get to. And we'll see that in just a moment. All right, here we go. Let's look at 13 and 14. This is kind of where we got to. Well, look at uh, 11 and 12. Now that no one is justified by law before God is evident. Okay, we just made that point. No one is justified before God by law. By, by keeping law perfectly. Well, why do we know that's evident? Well, look at what the law itself said. And here's the inconsistency part, at least one of them, where Paul says, all right, listen, even in the Old Testament, what did the prophet Habakkuk say in Habakkuk 2 verse 4? The just shall live how? Well, by faith. Now, we have to understand what he means there by what it means to live, to live by faith. We use that language, that terminology, two different ways, and we've got to make sure we understand what way it needs to be understood here, okay? Sometimes we use the language to live by to refer to the things that we do, okay? You live by the law of Christ. In other words, you you live your life, you conduct yourself according to the law of Christ. 
all right? Or we might say we live by faith. In other words, we, we conduct our lives in such a way, we make our choices, we do what we do based upon faith. We live by that. There's another way in which live by is used in Scripture. And it means not to conduct yourself, but to possess life. You live. You you possess life. Spiritual existence, spiritual vitality, spiritual life. It's a condition. The condition of being alive. Right? That's That's a different... That's a different concept, isn't it? The idea of possessing life, being alive, versus how you conduct yourself. Two different concepts, but expressed sometimes by the same language. Habakkuk says, the just shall live, shall possess life, shall be spiritually alive. How is, how do we possess Spiritual life by faith, not by perfect obedience. The just shall possess life through his faith. And Paul says, even the law of Moses told you that. Or at least one of the prophets who lived under the law of Moses told you that. That was true in the days of Habakkuk. That if spiritual life was going to be possessed, it was going to be possessed because of your faith not because of your personal ability to keep law perfectly. So, that no one, again, verse 11, now that no one is justified by law is evident because Habakkuk said, the just live and live in Galatians 3.11 is parallel to justified. That no one is justified by faith is evident because the just will live, be justified by his faith. But the law is not of faith, not the way you're using it, not the way you're approaching it. You're not approaching the law by faith. You're not approaching it as a means of expressing your faith. You're trying to be justified by it. He who practices them shall live by them. If you want to take that passage and you want to to press it to to a legalistic, in a legalistic fashion, then the only way you're going to live, the only way you're going to possess life is just by practicing the law perfectly. You want to live by the law? You want to possess spiritual life and have spiritual vitality by means of law? Then just do them. Just keep them. Keep them perfectly and you will. And good luck. But the just will possess life by means of their faith. All right? Now look at 13. Here's... here's You can either try to be justified by perfectly practicing the commandments or you can seek to be justified by approaching God by faith, by trusting Him to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Here's how Jesus fixed all of that. Christ, verse 13, Galatians 3. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. All right, so Paul calls them back to Jesus. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. What is the curse of the law? Well, it's not that the law was a curse. It's not he redeemed us from the curse that is the law. That's not what he's saying. He redeemed us from the curse that came to you, to us, because we tried to earn our salvation by means of law. The curse of the law is that helplessly lost condition that anyone is under when they try to earn salvation by means of their obedience. That's the curse of the law. It wasn't a problem with the law itself. Paul would say in Romans 7, the law is holy, righteous, and good. So the law wasn't a curse. 
The curse came when they misused the law. The curse came when they approached the law, as Paul would write in Romans 9, 32. The curse came because they did not pursue the law by faith, but as though it were by works. That's where the curse came. That's the curse that came from the law when they tried to approach the law legalistically. When they approached the law as if they could be justified by it by means of works, works of merit, instead of approaching the law by faith. As an expression of my obedience is my expression of faith and confidence in God, my Savior. Instead of I'm approaching the law as my Savior, forget God. I just need a law. This idea that God placed us on earth and threw a book at us and told us, have at it, call me when you're done, is anti-gospel. Now, did God give us a book? Sure he did. It's holy, righteous, and good. Does God want us to be serious about obeying it? Certainly he does. But did God base our salvation on our ability to do that? Perfectly? No. He gave us his law to govern our conduct, and we better be serious about it. But we also better realize that it's not my seriousness that's going to save me. It's his mercy and his grace. And so I, I completely and totally submit myself as best I possibly can to his will as an expression of my confidence in him and my lack of confidence in my ability to save myself. And doing that, approaching it that way, should really result in more of an appreciation for submitting to his will than approaching it legalistically would. He became a curse for us. In what way? Because the law itself says cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus suffered the penalty of one who had been condemned by law, even though he himself wasn't guilty. He became a curse for us because he suffered the, the penalty. He suffered the curse of one who was guilty of violating the law. That was what he suffered. But he didn't deserve to suffer that because he didn't violate the law. So him bearing the penalty for sin, he did on our behalf. And he did that so that, verse 14, in order that, why did he become a curse for us? Why did he allow himself to be treated as though he was a violator of the law when he wasn't? In order that, verse 14, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. The law of Moses wasn't given to the Gentiles, was it? Exodus 20, verses 1 to 3. The law was given to those whom the Lord brought up out of the land of Egypt. Jewish people, not the Gentiles. The law wasn't given to the Gentiles, the law of Moses. Well, then how were they going to be saved? Well, again, according to the Judaizers, they had to keep the law of Moses. Paul says, nope. Jesus suffered so that in him the Gentiles might be saved. So that in him the Gentiles could receive the promise given to Abraham. Not in the law. He didn't give them the law. He gave them the promise that predated the law of Moses. And so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now that brings us right back to where he started in the first part of Galatians 3. Remember that question he asked them? Verse 2, did you receive the Spirit by the works of law or by the hearing of faith? Rhetorical question. And he brings it back to that in verse 14. Through Jesus Christ, Gentiles could receive the promise made to Abraham, the promise of blessing all nations 
through his seed, Jesus, through Christ, the Gentiles could receive the promise of Abraham and that all of us could receive the promise of the Spirit. Didn't come through the law of Moses. Came through confident trust, obedient trust in Jesus Christ, our Savior, not in our ability to be perfect. All right. Now, when you get down to verse 15, and we're just going to be able to barely introduce this, one might naturally think, and, and, and a conscientious uh, Jewish Christian reading this letter for the first time, as he gets to the end of what we know is verse 14, it's very easy to think that this question might be on that person's mind. Well, well then, if the law was never given to be our Savior, then what was its purpose? Why'd we have it? Why'd you give it to us? If it wasn't as the means of our justification, Paul's going to answer that. He's actually going to get to that in verse 19, but, he's, but he begins setting that up in 15. Brethren, he says, I speak in terms of human relations, or I speak after the manner of men. Paul's going to give them an example, an illustration. Let me show you what I'm talking about when I say that the promise made to Abraham that predated the law of Moses, the promise is the focal point, or should have been. The promise that God made to Abraham, I will bless all nations through your seed. That promise ought to have been in the minds of the Jewish people, the focal point for their justification, the promise, and, and, and who, through whom that promise was going to be fulfilled. They got derailed by elevating the law above what God intended for the law to be. So he says, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Even though it's only a man's covenant, let's just talk about a covenant between people. Even though it's only a man's covenant, yet when it's been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Once a covenant, an agreement, is in place and binding on both parties, no one can come along later and add stipulations to that covenant. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Let's say I signed a legal agreement that I would purchase a brand new car for Kevin Rhodes if he would come over and mow my yard. Yes. Now, <clears throat> remember I said, if. Right. Let's say for the sake of example that I did that. Letter of agreement, he signs it, I sign, sign it, notari Patsy notarizes it for us. And he comes over and mows my yard per the agreement, and he says, okay, I'm ready for my car. And I grab my copy of the agreement, and I said, oh, oh, no, 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 look. The agreement says right here, I wrote this in, you know, after, after you signed it, but it says right here that you only receive the car if you mow my yard while wearing a pink tutu and singing the Canadian National Anthem. And you didn't do those things. Could I legally do that? I, I, I couldn't. I could not come along after the covenant, the agreement was ratified and add stipulations to it. You can't do that. Paul is saying the same thing here. Even though it's a man's covenant, you don't do that. Now, here's, what he, here's the application. Now, the promises, verse 16, were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. All right? Now, we'll give you the short version, and then we'll come back and fill in details next week, God willing. Now, look at 17. What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, after the promise, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. God made his promise to Abraham that he would bless all nations, Jew and Gentile, through his promised seed. And Paul says in verse 16, that seed is Christ. There's the promise. 
He says, now the law, the law of Moses, it came 430 years after the promise was made. So can the law then be added as a stipulation to receiving the blessing of the promise? Paul says, it cannot. That promise was given and ratified 430 years before the law of Moses ever came into existence. Therefore, you cannot bind that law on Gentile converts because their salvation is rooted in the promise that came 430 years before the law. That knocked the stuffings out of the Judaizers. All right. We'll, f- we'll flesh that out a little more, God willing, next week. All right, so there you go. Thank you for your kind attention this morning.